Hello, this is Siobhan and this is... Hi, I'm Harry. And welcome back to our podcast where we go through the Annals of Gothic Lit together. Last episode we read the first chapter of The Castle of Otranto. And would you like to summarise what happened there? Well, I was (laughs) traumatised. There was... A lot of Manfred, which is still a weird name for a prince. It's just an old, it's an old fashioned name. It just feels weird to call a prince Manfred, okay? Is this because I spend too much time in the Middle Ages? Yeah. It I feels, think. I'm not even sure if it's a medieval name, but it, it feels aesthetically medieval to me. For me, Manfred kind of feels like something that a 1920s newspaper comic would call a henpecked husband. The thing that really bothers me is the fact that the princess is named Hippolyta, actually, because why is she... That really bothers why, me. Why is this medieval princess named after the Queen of the Amazons? Yeah, that bothers me. It feels like we're I, swo- like we're just going all over the place with where our names came from. I, but yes, Manfred lost his mind. He lost his ever-loving mind. He decided to try to seduce... You left out what made Manfred lose his mind. I'm going to get there. I'm sorry, my lord. It's quite all right. He's decided he wants to seduce Isabella, who is, to recap, the princess who was sent there to marry his son Conrad, a 15-year-old, who is not very much liked by the author. Conrad couldn't make it to the wedding because he was killed by a giant helmet. That fell from the sky. That fell from the sky and squished him. Flat. And Manfred looked at the body and was like, eh, I guess I'll marry Isabella. Need to get them babies. Better get a divorce. Yeah, so uh, we've had Isabella fleeing from Manfred, being helped by the mysterious youth who turned up and was imprisoned in the helmet. There's been a lot of Manfred yelling at his wife and his daughter and basically being a meanie pants. And ghosts. Are ghosts and servants being hilarious? I mean... It sounds a little bit like we're not explaining everything properly in this summary, but honestly, this is actually just what the first chapter is like. Yeah, no, this is this is an accurate representation of what happened. This novel doesn't make much sense. No. Okay, so on to chapter two. Chapter two. Matilda, who, by Hippolyta's order, had retired to her apartment, was ill-disposed to take any rest. The shocking fate of her brother had deeply affected her. She was I mean, surprised. Obviously, she saw him get crushed to death by a flying helmet. Really doesn't seem to be... No one, apart from Hippolyta, seems to be grieving him. Which, I mean, I know he's been described as... I mean, Matilda's grieving him here, and to be fair. Matilda, kind of pointless. This is Matilda grieving him. I just also... Way to state the obvious. I know. She was surprised at not seeing Isabella. But the strange words which had fallen from her father and his obscure menace to the princess's wife, accompanied by the most furious behaviour... How is it obscure? I mean, honestly, from the description of Isabella of Manfred's behaviour, this is pretty much de rigueur. He's always like this. Really obvious as well. Yeah, like he literally came in and was like... I'm going to I put you Isabella. aside and marry Isabella. Don't want you anymore. Looking for... Are you jealous of Isabella, my wife? Find her for me. I don't think he's actually told Hippolyta he's divorcing No, he's not. I just thought that was so obvious from his manner, you know? It is quite obvious. Bring me the nubile virgin, I mean. But the strange words which had fallen from her father and his obscure menace to the princess's wife, accompanied by the most furious behaviour, had filled her gentle mind with terror and alarm. She waited anxiously for the return of Bianca, a young damsel that attended her, whom she had sent to learn what was become of Isabella. Bianca soon appeared and informed her mistress of what she had gathered from the servants, that Isabella was nowhere to be found. She related the adventure of the young peasant, who had been discovered in the vault, though with many simple additions from the incoherent accounts of the domestics, and she dwelled principally on the gigantic leg and foot which had been seen in the gallery chamber. Which, I mean... Why wouldn't you dwell on that? I mean, that's understandable. That's definitely the weirdest thing that's happened today, other than the flying helmet. Yeah, like, I think I, if I was Bianca, I would definitely be like, oh, mistress, mistress, Isabella's still missing, and that weirdo from under the helmet has been found in the vaults of all places. But did you know? Leg and a foot! Giant! Giant leg and a foot! Hey, hey, mistress, we know what, we know where the helmet came from. We do. Aren't you relieved to have the helmet have come from somewhere? 
Demons or ghosts? I mean, honestly, I would... Or a giant. I would find a flying helmet without the presence of a giant much more unsettling. On some yeah, level. like, where did it come from? Right, the Why fact did that it come the giant from? is there is just like, ah, oh, mystery solved. Yeah, I mean... A giant, giant dropped exists, his helmet. But maybe we can sue him. Well, I mean, you're a medieval Catholic. You probably believe giants exist because they're in the Bible. I know, but... Um, well, I mean, I suppose you believe they existed at Goliath one point. Goliath is only nine feet tall. He's not that big. I suppose it's the giants. The giants of old have uh, died out because they've moved further away from the image of God over the centuries and thus got shorter, which yep. is sort of troubling because does that mean that Adam was the size of God? No, I mean... Does God have a size? The giants does God were have a prescribed The giants size? came from the angels having sex with women. So I think no, that... No, no, the... that's an Ephilim. The giants that were the great men of old. Yeah, but they weren't size giants. They were just... People no, giants. they were they were tall too. They got men got shorter as time went by, and they moved further away from the image of God. Cite me a biblical verse. I don't remember. It's because been a while. Goliath giants came from the Nephilim. That's biblically where they came Different from. Different giants. I get that. The but patriarchs. I don't remember anything in the Bible talking about Adam being a giant. Actually, they I talk about him that's living for a long time. Maybe that's apocryphal. He lived for like 900 years. I'm sure years this is and, a... Okay, got... we're going to look this up before the next episode. Yes. She's making a face at me that says she thinks she's going to win. I mean, I'm not sure that I'm going to win because I can't... I... Because my biblical knowledge comes from a very reduced Bible and none of the apocryphal... Oh. Uh, works so whether or not oh. it exists in the apocryphal when you say uh, reduced bible do you just mean the apocrypha wasn't in there or do you mean they actually snipped out bits of the protestant bible too no there's the protestant bible i mean oh, okay. the, some of yeah. the bibles that were in uh the uh the uh the, the place where i was was brought up in the church just my, say cult you yeah. can say cult it's okay can i say a cult you can say cult <laughs> the place the cult that i was this podcast up... has not gone where i thought it was gonna go today <laughs> No, the cult, the cult where I was brought up had written their own version of the Bible, technically. But they hadn't really changed it that much, I know, because I've also read other versions of the Bible. They just added a lot of footnotes explaining um, what God really meant. Footnotes. Lots of footnotes. <coughs> they also changed the beginning of the Bible a little bit, but only to include the potential for explaining creation via the gap theory. She looks so horrified. But you know, it's a cult. What do you expect? Not footnotes. Oh, the footnotes. We used to pray read the footnotes. Okay, okay. I think... I think... Let's... I think we should move on. Yeah. Anyway, that's why I'm not sure I'm going to win. If it was mentioned in the Apocrypha, then I wouldn't have any knowledge of it because we really only stuck to oh, the you know Protestant what? Bible. It's possible it's not actually in the Bible. It's possible it's doctrine. Ah, that's definitely possible because our... The Catholic Church did like to make up fan fiction and declare it was true. For example, the reason that a lot of the paintings of the Virgin Mary depict a blonde 12-year-old standing on an upside-down crescent moon is because one day a pope had a dream that that was what she looked like and he declared she should always be depicted that way in future. That would explain it because there, there I, is, I will swear to you there is no biblical... Um... We'll check. Yeah. We'll check. But back on, back on topic because... I'm sorry. We shouldn't have, I shouldn't have started this. <laughs> okay, so gigantic leg and foot is being Bia Bianca's main topic of conversation. This last circumstance had terrified Bianca so much that she was rejoiced when Matilda told her that she would not go to rest, but would watch till the princess should rise. The young princess wearied herself with conjectures on the flight of Isabella and on the threats of Manfred to her mother. But what business could he have so urgent with the chaplain? said Matilda. Does he? Oh, I. Begins with a D. I'm so sorry, I forgot that this book doesn't do quotation marks. Does he intend to have my brother's body interred privately in the chapel? Oh, madame! said Bianca. I don't know why she's got that voice, but she does. I'm rolling with it. <laughs> now, I guess. As you are become his heiress, he is impatient to have you married. He has always been raving for more sons, I warrant. He is now impatient for grandsons. As sure as I live, madam, I shall see you a bride at last. 
Good madam, you won't cast off your faithful Bianca. You won't put Donna Rosara over me. Now you are a great princess. Oh, there is some, like, tension between Bianca and Rosara. Mm-hmm. Mm. I mean, I've got to say, actually, Bianca's take is much more reasonable. I know. It's, it's like a, a proper reasonable thing that Manfred actually should be doing. I don't know why he's gone, like, I have to now marry Isabella and have sons myself. Because why grandsons just... don't count if they're got through the, through the Salic line. Oh, of course. Like, obviously they can inherit your kingdom in this context, oh, of course. but yeah, they're not they're... real grandsons. They're, they're another man. He- they're right. another yeah, man's actually, grandsons. Actually, no, I should have thought of that, yes. But also, I just, like, him arranging Matilda a marriage would be a much more reasonable thing for him to be doing right now than having a private funeral for his son, given the rest of his behaviour today. Yes. Or getting a divorce, you know, which is his actual plan. Gasp. My poor Bianca! said Matilda. How fast your thoughts amble. I, a great princess, what hast thou seen in Manfred's behaviour since my brother's death that bespeaks any increase of tenderness to me? No, Bianca, his heart was ever a stranger to me, but he is my father, and I must not complain. I mean, it's selling... like a common thing yes. girls say in these things. Yes. Actually, no, I mean, it's very common throughout this one. I'm not sure if it's common overall, the genre, the genre because I've read a fairly spotty selection of gothic novels, but mm. I just... Why does she think he would... Him selling you into marriage with someone in order to get heirs upon your body is not actually an especially loving act, darling. That's, that's, politi- <laughs> that's politics and convenience. I know. Nay, if heaven shuts my father's heart against me, it overpays my little merit in the tenderness of my mother. Oh, oh wait, no. Yeah, no, this is still Matilda. Oh, that dear mother. Yes, Bianca, tis there I feel the rugged temper of Manfred. I can support his harshness to me with patience, but it wounds my soul when I am witness to his causeless severity towards her. Oh, madam said Bianca. All men use their wives so when they are weary of them. Bianca's not wrong. Yeah, Bianca's Bianca's smart. See, Bianca's on point here. You're meant to think Bianca is a dimwit, but she's not wrong. Yeah, the author is telling on himself. I know. Obviously not all men and we're talking about historic men. And yet you congratulated me but now, said Matilda, when you fancied my father intended to dispose of me. I would have you a great lady, replied Bianca. Come what will, I do not wish to see you moped in a convent as you would be if you had your will. And if my lady, your mother, who knows that a bad husband is better than no husband at all, did not hinder you, bless me. What noise is that? St. Nicholas, forgive me. I was but in jest. In jest about what? I... Possibly about how... Oh, bad husbands, maybe? Yeah, maybe. maybe. Oh, heaven forbid we talk bad about a man. Mm -hmm. It is the wind, said Matilda, whistling through the basements in the tower above. You have heard it a thousand times. Nay, said Bianca. There There was no harm neither in what I said. It is no sin to talk of matrimony. And so, madam, as I was saying, if my Lord Manfred should offer you a handsome young prince for a bridegroom, you would drop him a curtsy and tell him you would rather take the veil. Thank heaven I am in no such danger, <laughs> said Matilda. You know how many proposals for me he has rejected. And you thank him like a dutiful daughter, do you, madam? But come, madam, suppose tomorrow morning he was to send for you to the great council chamber and there you should find his elbow a lovely young prince with large black eyes, a smooth white forehead and manly curling locks like jet. In short, madam, a young hero, resembling the picture of the good Alfonso in the gallery, which you sit and gaze at for hours together. Do not speak lightly of that picture, Matilda interrupted has a wafer. Matilda. Matilda has a wafer. Aw. 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 I've just thought, I've just... Agenda swapped wafer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's in love with the picture, isn't she? It's going to get more annoying. Oh, boy. Do not speak lightly of that picture, 
interrupted Matilda, sighing. I know the adoration with which I look at that picture is uncommon, but I am not in love with a coloured panel. The character of that virtuous prince, the veneration with which my mother has inspired me for his memory, the orisons, which I know not why she has enjoined me to pour forth at his tomb, all have concurred to persuade me that somehow or other my destiny is linked with something relating to him. I just want to say right right here that I'm so glad I'm not a teenager anymore. I know. God, being a teenager is awful. So many emotions, so little time. <sighs> Such a weird relationship with fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, madam, how should that be? said Bianca. I have always heard that your family was no way related to his, and I am sure I cannot conceive why my lady the princess sends you in cold morning or damp evening to pray at his tomb. He is no saint by the almanac. If you must pray, why does she not beg you address yourself to our great Saint Nicholas? I am sure he is the saint I pray to for a husband. <laughs> perhaps my perhaps my mind would be less affected said Matilda, if my mother would explain her reasons to me. But it is the mystery she observes that inspires me with this. I, I know not what to call it. As she never acts from caprice, I am sure there is some fatal secret at bottom. Nay, I know there is. In her agony of grief for my brother's death, she dropped some words that intimated as much. Oh, dear madam, cried Bianca, what were they? <laughs> no, said Matilda. If a parent lets fall a word and wishes it recalled, it is not for a child to utter it. What? Was she sorry for what she had said? asked Bianca. I am sure, madam, you may trust me. Give Bianca the scandal. Right, like Matilda. Don't dangle juicy gossip over Bianca's head and then say, Oh, Tell I her. can't possibly. Though, I mean, I have to say as well, the obvious answer here is that they were the previous family who held the principality and your family inherited from it from them through some connection or other and because they're an extinct line you pray for them because they don't have any descendants to pray for them and it's a kind and courteous and honorable thing to do i mean that's just or it's because of the curse okay but i don't think matilda knows about the curse but isn't it mentioned earlier in this book doesn't everyone know about the curse i don't expect logical consistency oh because, you know, that would make sense. That would be like, pray to the sky because of the curse. Also, nobody then seems we don't to die. have connected... I, I don't know, Matilda doesn't seem to have connected this to the curse in any way, which makes no sense. Very few people seem to have connected it. Manfred seems to be the only person connecting things. Well, no, Hippolyta clearly knows what's up. Yeah, and, and the young youth turned up and was like, that looks like the armour. Spoilers, spoilers. It's the beginning of the book. No, no, I'm discussing the youth further. Spoilers, spoilers. Where am I? <laughs> with my own little secrets, when I have any, I may, said Matilda, but never with my mother's. A child ought to have no ears or eyes, but as a parent directs. That's actually worse read aloud than when I read it quietly to myself in the bar. Really? Yeah. Haha. <laughs> it sounds so much worse out loud. It's like the opposite of the servant dialogue. Well, to be sure, madam, you was born to be a saint, said Bianca, and there's no resisting one's vocation. You will end in a convent at last. But, but there is my lady Isabella would not be so reserved to me. She will let me talk to her young men, and when a young handsome cavalier has come to the castle, she has owned to me that she wished your brother Conrad resembled him. Not a thing to talk about when Conrad's just died. Really? Don't you go telling his sister these things. I mean, to be fair, is it, I, mean, I, th I think Matilda was very clear Isabella didn't want to get married to him. It would be hard to miss. Bianca, said the princess, I do not allow you to mention my friend disrespectfully. Isabella is of a cheerful disposition, but her soul is pure as virtue itself. She knows your idle babbling humour, and perhaps has now and then encouraged it to divert melancholy, and to enliven the solitude in which my father keeps us. Blessed Mary, said Bianca, starting, there it is again. 
Can I just say cheerful is a great euphemism for, uh... Hmm. Should we say flighty? Boy crazy? Boy crazy! Uh... There's a word I'm missing. Um... Lydia Bennett? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll... She's of a cheerful disposition. <laughs> it'll come to me later. Mary is another word for it. <laughs> Okay, go, go, go. Dear madam, do you hear nothing? I think I may have meant horny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. This castle is certainly haunted. Peace, said Matilda, and listen. I did think I heard a voice, but it must be fancy. Your terrors, I suppose, have infected me. Indeed, indeed, madam said Bianca, half weeping with agony. I am sure I heard a voice. Does anybody lie in... Sorry, wrong person. Does anybody lie in the chamber beneath? Said the princess. Nobody has dared to lie there, answered Bianca, since the great astrologer that was your brother's tutor drowned himself. I feel like this is something you just drop into conversation. Yeah, I, I feel like that... Uh, required... That's like a plot point. I feel that required more exposition, really. I feel like that's just like... You you can't do that to me, writer. You can't just be like, Oh, by the way, the prince had a great astrologer tutor who drowned himself in the haunted room. No one lives there. You don't just drop that on me! And yet. And yet, here we are. For certain, madam, his ghost and the young princes are now met in the chamber below. For heaven's sake, let us fly to your mother's apartment. I charge you not to stir, said Matilda. If they are spirits in pain, we may ease their sufferings by questioning them. They can mean no hurt to us, for we have not injured them. And if they should, shall we be more safe in one chamber than in another? Reach me my beads. We shall say a prayer, then speak to them. See, up until now, Matilda's been kind of irritating. But here she takes the turn for the badass. Yeah, this is pretty cool. I like this. Oh, dear lady, I would not speak to a ghost for the world! <laughs> cried Bianca. As she said those words, they heard the casement of the little chamber below Matilda's open. They listened attentively, and a few minutes thought they heard a person sing, but could not distinguish the words. This can be no evil spirit, said the princess in a low voice. It is undoubtedly one of the family. Open the window and we shall know the voice. I dare not indeed, madam, said Bianca. Thou art a very fool, said Matilda, opening the window gently herself. The noise the princess made was, however, heard by the person beneath, who stopped, and they concluded, had heard the casement open. Is anybody below, said the princess. If there is, speak. Yes, said an unknown voice. Who is it? said Matilda. A stranger, replied <laughs> the voice. What stranger? said she. Such and how cryptic. didst thou come there at this unusual hour when all the gates of the castle are locked? I am not here willingly, answered the voice. But pardon me, lady, if I have disturbed your rest. I knew not that I was overheard. Sleep had forsaken me. I left a restless couch and came to waste the irksome hours with gazing on the fair approach of morning, impatient to be dismissed from this castle. Thy words and accents, said Matilda, are of a melancholy cast. If thou art unhappy, I pity thee. If poverty afflicts thee, let me know it. I will mention thee to the princess, who beneficent soul ever melts for the distressed, and she will relieve thee. I am indeed unhappy said the stranger, and I know not what wealth is, but I do not complain of the lot which heaven has cast for me. I am young and healthy, and am not ashamed of owing my support to myself. Yet think me not proud, or that I disdain your generous offer. I will remember you in my orisons, and will pray for blessings on your gracious self and your noble mistress. If I say, lady, it is for others, not for myself. <laughs> She's doing eyebrows. <coughs> Now I have it, madam, said Bianca, whispering to the princess. This is certainly the young peasant, and by my conscience he is in love. Well, this is a charming adventure. Do, madam, let us sift him. He does not know you, but takes you for one of my lady Hippolyta's women. 
Art thou not ashamed, Bianca? said the princess. What Why right have like we this? to pry into the secrets of this young man's heart? He seems virtuous and frank, and tells us he is unhappy. Are those circumstances that authorise us to make a property of him? How are we entitled to his confidence? Lord, madam, how little you know of love, replied Bianca. Why, lovers have no pleasure equal to talking of their mistress. And would you have me become a pe peasant's confidant, said the princess. Well then, let me talk to him, said Bianca. Though I have the honour of being your highness's maid of honour, I was not always so great. Besides, if love levels rank, it raises them too. I have a respect for any young man in love. Peace, simpleton! said the princess. Though he said he was unhappy, it does not follow that he must be in love. Think of all that has happened today and tell me if there's no misfortunes that but what love causes. Stranger, resumed the princess, if thy misfortunes have not been occasioned by thine own fault and are within the compass of the princess Hippolyta's power to redress, I will take upon me to answer that she will be thy prote protectress. When thou art dismissed from this castle, repair to Holy Father Jerome at the convent adjoining the church of St. Nicholas, and make thy story known to him. As far as thou thinkest meet, he will not fail to inform the princess, who is the mother of all that want her assistance. Farewell, it is not seemly for me to hold farther converse with a man at this unwanted hour. May the saints guard thee, gracious lady, replied the peasant. But, oh, if a poor and worthless stranger might presume to beg a minute's audience farther, am I so happy? The casement is not shut, might I venture to ask? Speak quietly, said Matilda. The morning draws apace. Should the labourers come into the fields and perceive us, what wouldst thou ask? I know not how, I know not if I dare, said the young stranger, faltering. Yet the humanity which, with which you have spoken to me in boldness, lady, dare I trust you? Heaven, said Matilda, what dost thou mean? With what wouldst thou trust me? Speak boldly, if thy secret is fit to be entrusted to a virtuous breast. Okay, you know what she meant. Yes, I do. That's why I was doing those eyebrows. Oh, I thought you were making a joke. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought she was being a little bit pompous. Oh, well, yeah, but it's a gothic novel. I have to stop saying that in response to things. Yes. Oh, well, it's a gothic novel. <coughs> I would ask, said the peasant, recollecting himself, whether what I have heard from the domestics is true, that the princess is missing, missing from the castle. What imports it to thee to know, replied Matilda. Thy first words bespoke a prudent and becoming gravity. Dost thou come hither to pry into the secrets of Manfred? Adieu, I have been mistaken in thee. Saying these words, she shut the casement hastily, without giving the young man time to reply. And here she achieves peak slappable. I have acted more wisely, said the princess to Bianca with some sharpness, if I had let thee converse with this peasant. His inquisitiveness seems of a piece with thy own. It is not fit for me to argue with your highness, replied Bianca, but perhaps the questions I could, should have put to him would have been more to the purpose than those you have been pleased to ask him. Oh, no doubt, said Matilda, you are a very discreet personage. May I know what you would have asked him? A bystander often sees more of the game than those at that play, answered Bianca. Does your highness think, madam, that his question about my lady Isabella was a result of more mere curiosity? No, no, madam. There is more in it than you great folks are aware of. Lopez told me that all the servants believe this young fellow contrived to my lady Isabella's escape. Now pray, madam, observe. You and I both know that my lady Isabella never much fancied the prince your brother. Well, he is killed just in the critical moment. I accuse nobody. A helmet falls from the moon, so my lord your father says. But Lopez and all the servants say this young spark is a magician and stole it from Alfonso's tomb. A helmet falls from the moon. Have done with this rhapsody of impertinence, said Matilda. Nay, madam, as you please, cried Bianca. Yet it is a very particular thought that my lady Isabella should be missing the very same day and that this young sorcerer should be found at the mouth of the trapdoor. I accuse nobody. This is how people get burned at the stake, Bianca. Yes, you keep saying I accuse nobody right up to it. I'm not saying she's a witch, but... 
But if my young lord came honestly by his death, dare not on thy duty, said Matilda, to breathe a suspicion on the purity of my dear Isabella's fame. Purity or not purity, said Bianca, gone she is. A stranger is found that nobody knows. You question him yourself, he tells you he's in love or unhappy, it's the same thing. Nay, he owned he was unhappy about others. And is anybody unhappy about another unless they're in love with them? And at the very next word, he asks innocently, poor soul, if by Isabella is missing. I mean, I imagine Isabella's unhappy about Manfred right now. It's not because she's in love with him. I mean, true. But she's not unhappy on Manfred's behalf. Oh, that's true. <coughs> I mean, Hipp- Matilda's unhappy about Hippolyta because she's she her mother. Her. Yeah, but she's not in love with her. Yeah, but... point. Oh, yeah, in love. To be sure, said Matilda, thy observations are not totally without foundation. Isabella's flight amazes me. The curiosity of the stranger is very particular. Yet, Isabella never concealed a thought from me. So she told you, said Bianca, to fish out your secrets. But who knows, madam? But the stranger may be some prince in disguise. Do, madam, let me open the window and ask him a few questions. That escalated quickly. No, replied Matilda. I will ask him myself. If he knows aught of Isabella, he is not worthy that I should converse farther with him. She was going to open the casement when they heard a bell ring at the postern gate of the castle, which was on the right hand of the tower, where Matilda lay. This prevented the princess from renewing the conversation with the stranger. After continuing silent for some time, I am persuaded, said she to Bianca, that whatever be the cause of Isabella's flight, it had no unworthy motive. If the stranger was accessory to it, she must be satisfied of his fidelity and worth. I observed, did not you, Bianca, that his words were tinctured with an uncommon infusion of piety. It was no ruffian speech. His phrases were becoming a man of gentle birth. I told you, madam, said Bianca, that I was sure he was some prince in disguise. Yet, said Matilda, if he was privy to her escape, how will you account for his not accompanying her in her flight? Why expose himself unnecessarily? Oh, sorry. Why expose himself unnecessarily and rashly to my father's resentment? As for that, madam, replied she, if he could get from under the helmet, he will find ways of eluding your father's anger. I do not doubt, but he has some talisman or other about him. You resolve everything into magic, said Matilda. But a man who has any intercourse with infernal spirits does not dare to make use of those tremendous and holy words which he has uttered. Didst thou not observe with what further he vowed to remember me to heaven in his prayers? Yes, Isabella was undoubtedly convinced of his piety. Commend me to the piety of a young fellow and a damsel that consult to elope, said Bianca. No, no, madam. My lady Isabella is of another guess mould than you take her for. She used indeed to sigh and lift up her eyes in your company because she knows you're a saint. But when your back was turned, you wrong her, said That's Matilda. That's so rude. I know. Isabella is no hypocrite. She has a due sense of devotion, but never affected a call she has not. On the contrary, she always combated my inclination for the cloister, and though I own the mystery she has made to me of her flight confounds me, though it seems inconsistent with the friendship between us, I cannot forget the disinterested warmth with which she always opposed my taking the veil. She wished to see me married, though my dower would have been a loss to her and my brother's children. For her sake, I will believe well of this young peasant. Then you do think there's some liking between them, said Bianca. A stretch. While she was speaking, a servant came hastily into the chamber and told the princess that the Lady Isabella was found. Where? said Matilda. She has taken sanctuary in St. Nicholas's church, replied the servant. Father Jerome has brought the news himself. He's below with his highness. Where is my mother? said Matilda. She's in her own chamber, madam, and has asked for you. Manfred had risen at the first dawn of light and gone to Hippolyta's apartment to inquire if she knew aught of Isabella. While he was questioning her, word was brought that Jerome demanded to speak with him. Manfred, little suspecting the cause of the friar's arrival and knowing he was employed by Hippolyta in her charities, ordered him to be admitted, intending to leave them together while he pursued his search after Isabella. 
is your business with me or the princess? said Manfred. With both, replied the holy man. The Lady Isabella. What of her? interrupted Manfred eagerly. Just chill, you're making yourself look suspicious. Is at St. Nicholas's altar, replied Jerome. That is no business of Hippolyta, said Manfred with confusion. Let us retire to my chamber, father, and inform me how she came thither. No, my lord, replied the good man with an air of firmness <laughs> and authority that daunted even the resolute Manfred who could not help revering the saint-like virtues of Jerome. My commission is to both, and with your highness's good liking and the presence of both I shall deliver it. But first, my lord, I must interrogate the princess whether she is acquainted with the cause of the Lady Isabella's retirement from your castle. You're going to have to explain yourself to your wife, sir. Yeah, yeah. The priest uh, the priest wants to see you explain uh, to your wife uh, what, what you, you did. did. He is... There's very little joy in the life of a celibate man. He's really just here for the drama. Yeah, yeah. He wants to. He wants to see you uh, squirm a little bit. No, on my soul," said Hippolyta. <sighs> Does Isabella charge me with being privy to it? Father," interrupted Manfred. "I pray true reverence to your holy profession, but I am sovereign here, and I will allow no meddling priest to interfere in the affairs of my domestic." Once if you have aught to say, priest. attend me to my chamber. I do not use to let my wife be acquainted with the secret affairs of my state. They are not within a woman's province. You know, I would have expected you to find my statement funnier. I mean, it was it was definitely funny. Thank you. You're welcome. My lord, said the holy man, I am no intruder into the secrets of families. My office is to promote peace, to heal divisions, to preach repentance, and teach mankind to curb their headstrong passions. So basically to deal with Manfred. I like the voice you've chosen for him. Thank you. I forgive your highness's uncharitable apostrophe. I know my duty. And I am the minister of mightier prince than Manfred. <laughs> Hearken to him who speaks through my organs. And now now that got creepy. Oh, yeah. That's a creepy line. <laughs> I mean, I know he doesn't mean it like that, but it's still a creepy okay, line. It, it definitely made it sound like pulp sci-fi robot nightmare. I mean, I like that. I mean, I enjoy that. I'm, I'm, I approve. I just good, wanted good. to comment on it. I'm disruptive. Manfred trembled with rage and shame. Hippolyta's countenance Manfred declared, feels shame. I don't think he does. I question. I think the writer's lying to us. I question. Hippolyta's countenance declared her astonishment and impatience to know where this would end. Her silence more strongly spoke her observance of Manfred. The Lady Isabella, resumed Jerome, commends herself to both your highnesses. She thanks both for the kindness with which she has been treated in your castle. She deplores the loss of your son and her own misfortune in not becoming the daughter of such a wise and noble princess, whom she shall always respect as parents. <laughs> <laughs> parents, Manfred, do you hear that? It's in italics. She, parents. She prays for uninterrupted uninterrupted union and felicity between you here <laughs> Manfred's colour changed but oh, as it is no longer it possible for her to be allied to you she entreats your consent to remain in sanctuary till she can learn news of her father or by the certainty of his death be at liberty with the approbation of her guardians to dispose of herself in suitable marriage I shall give oh, I shall give no such consent said the prince, but insist on her return to the gas castle without delay. Unfortunately for you, that's not how sanctuary works. I am answerable for her person to her guardians and will not brook her being in any hands but my own. Your highness will recollect whether that can any longer be proper, <laughs> replied the friar. I want no monitor, said Manfred, colouring. Isabella's conduct leaves room for strange suspicions, and that young villain, who is at least the accomplice of her flight, if not the cause of it... The cause? interrupted Jerome. Was a young man <laughs> the cause? 
God, this man is a uh, very pointed with his commentary. He serves a higher power than you and thus feels no fear. The father is out of fucks to give. This is not to be born, cried Manfred. Am I to be bearded in my own palace by an insolent monk? I mean, you are, clearly. It's happening. Right now. Thou art privy, I guess, to their amours. I would pray to heaven to clear up your uncharitable surmises, said Jerome. If your highness was not satisfied in your conscience how unjustly you accuse me, I do pray to heaven to pardon that uncharitableness, and I implore your highness to leave the princess in peace, in that holy place, where she is not liable to be disturbed by such vain and worldly fantasies as discourses of love from any man. <laughs> Can't not to me, said Manfred, but return and bring the princess to her duty. It is my duty to prevent her return hither said Jerome. She is where orphans and virgins are safest from the snares and wiles of this world, and nothing but a parent's authority shall take her thence. I am her parent, cried Manfred, and demand her. Really, Manfred, I think it's very inappropriate I mean, for you to say that at this point. I mean, Jerome was trying to tell you that this whole time, but he doesn't really think that your, um... Your actions are appropriate for parenthood. Mm -hmm. And that you should stop. She wished to have you for her parent, oh. said the friar. But heaven that forbid that connection has forever dissolved all ties betwixt you. And I announce to your highness, stop, audacious man, said Manfred, and dread my displeasure. He dreads nothing. Holy father, said Hippolyta, it is your office to be no respecter of persons. You must speak as your duty prescribes, but it is my duty to hear nothing that it pleases not my lord I should hear. I will retire to my oratory and pray to the blessed virgin to inspire you with her holy counsels and to restore the heart of my gracious lord to its wonted peace and gentleness. See, that could absolutely have been intended as very careful and clever shade on Hippolyta's part, but the author just doesn't understand how women work. I know, right? Ah, <sighs> we could have had it all. Excellent woman, said the friar. My lord, I attend your pleasure. Manfred, accompanied by the friar, passed to his own apartment, where, shutting the door, I perceive, father, said he, that Isabella has acquainted you with my purpose. Now hear my resolve and obey. Reasons of state, most urgent reasons, my own and the safety of my people, demand that I should have a son. It is in vain to expect an heir from Hippolyta. I have made choice of Isabella. You must bring her back, and you must do more. I know the influence you have with Hippolyta. Her conscience is in your hands. She is, I allow, a faultless woman, and her soul is set on heaven, and scorns the little grandeur of this world. You can withdraw her from it entirely. Is he telling... Oh, convent. Yeah, and it does sound like he's trying to ask the father to murder her, doesn't it? It really does. Persuade her to consent to the dissolution of our marriage and to retire into a monastery. She shall endow one if she will, and she shall have the means of being as liberal to your order as she or you can wish. Thus, you will divert the calamities that are hanging over our heads and have the merit of saving the principality of Otranto from destruction. You are a prudent man. And though the warmth of my temper betrayed me into some unbecoming expressions, I honour your virtue and wish to be indebted to you for the repose of my life and the preservation of my family. The will of heaven be done, said the friar. I am but its worthless instrument. It makes use of my tongue to tell thee, prince, of thy unwarrantable designs. The injuries of the virtuous Hippolyta have mounted to the throne of pity. By me thou art reprimanded for thy adulterous intention of repudiating her. By me thou art warned not to pursue the incestuous design on thy contracted daughter. Heaven, that delivered her from thy fury, when the judgment so recently fallen on thy house ought to have inspired thee with other thoughts, will continue to watch over her. Even I, a poor and despised friar, am able to protect her from thy violence. I sinner that I am, and uncharitably reviled by your highness as an accomplice of I know not what amours, scorn the allurements with which it has pleased thee to tempt mine honesty. I love my order, I honour devout souls, I respect the piety of thy princess, but I will not betray thy confidence she reposes in me, nor serve even the cause of religion by foul and sinful compliances. 
but forsooth. The welfare of the state depends on your highness having a son. Heaven mocks the short-sighted views of man. But yestermorn, whose house was so great, so flourishing as Manfred's? Where is oh. young Conrad now? Harsh. My lord, I respect your tears, but I mean not to check them. Let them flow, prince. They will weigh more with heaven towards the welfare of thy subjects than a marriage, which founded on lust or policy, could never prosper. The sceptre which passed from the race of Alfonso to thine cannot be preserved by a match which the church will never allow. If it is the will of the Most High that Manfred's name must perish, resign yourself, my lord, to its decrees, and thus deserve a crown that can never pass away. Come, my lord, I like this sorrow. Let us return to the princess. She is not apprised of your cruel intentions, nor did I mean more than to alarm you. You saw with what gentle patience, with what efforts of love she heard. She rejected hearing the extent of your guilt. I know she longs to fold you in her arms and assure her, ensure you of her unalterable affection. Father, said the prince, you mistake my compunction. True! I honour Hippolyta's virtues. I think her a saint, and wish it were for my soul's health to tie faster the knot that has ununited us. But alas, father, you know not the bitterest of my pangs. It is some time that I have had scruples on the legality of our union. Thinking on his feet here. Hippolyta is related to me in the fourth degree. It is true we had a dispensation, but I have been informed that she had also been contracted to another. This it is that sits he heavy on my heart. To this state of unlawful wedlock, I impute the visitation that has fallen on me and the death of Conrad. Ease my conscience of this burden. Dissolve our marriage and accomplish the work of godliness which your divine exhortations have commenced in my soul. You don't have a soul. Okay, but my question is, Manfred, if you're thinking that your line is cursed because you're married to a woman who is related to you in the fourth degree and was contracted to another, how will your line become uncursed by marrying your daughter? I don't think he thinks that's why his line is cursed. I think he's just... No, I know, but his logic is forward here. If he's trying oh, to convince yeah, the no, priest it's like... this... I just appreciate the priest. So you think you, you're you married to a Hippolyta's adulteress because she had a pre-existing engagement and you want to marry your daughter mm -hmm. and you think that with a pre-existing engagement well i mean that engagement is now dead but you want yeah. to marry your daughter do you know how you sound you sound like you're a lying liar i love you how cutting was the anguish which the good man felt when he perceived this turn in the wily prince he trembled for Hippolyta, whose ruin he saw was determined and he feared. If Manfred had no hope of recovering Isabella, that his impatience for a son would direct him to some other object, who might not be equally proof against the temptation of Manfred's rank. For some time the holy man remained absorbed in thought. At length, conceiving some hope from delay, he thought the wisest conduct would be to prevent the prince from despairing or of recovering Isabella. Her! The friar knew he could dispose from her affection to Hippolyta and from the aversion she had expressed him for Manfred's addresses to second his views till the censures of the church could be fulminated against a divorce. With this intention, as if struck with the prince's scruples, he at length, says, he at length said, My lord, I have been pondering on what your highness has said. And if in truth it is delicacy or conscience that is the real motive of your repugnance to your virtuous lady, far be it from me to endeavour to harden your heart. The church is an indulgent mother, and fold your griefs to her. She alone can administer comfort to your soul, either by satisfying your conscience or, upon examination of your scruples, by setting you at liberty and indulging you in the lawful means of continuing your lineage. In the latter case, if the Lady Isabella can be brought to consent... Manfred, who concluded that he had either overreached the good man, or that his first warmth had been but a tribute paid to appearance, was overjoyed at this sudden turn, and repeated the most magnificent promises. If he shall succeed by the father's mediation, the well-meaning priest suffered him to deceive himself, fully determined to traverse his views instead of seconding them. Since we now understand one another, resumed the prince. Do we, though? Do I we? expect, father, that you satisfy me in one point. Who is the youth that we found in the vault? He must have been privy to Isabella's flight. Tell me truly, is he her lover, or is he an agent for another's passion? 
I have often suspected Isabella's indifference to my son. A thousand circumstances crowd on my mind that confirm that suspicion. She herself was so conscious of it that while I discoursed her in the gallery, she outran my suspicions and endeavoured to justify herself from coolness to Conrad. The Friar who knew nothing of the youth but what he had learned occasionally from the princess, ignorant what had beca was become of him, and not sufficiently reflecting on the impetuosity of Manfred's temper, conceived that it might not be amiss to sow the seeds of jealousy in his mind. They might be turned to some use hereafter, either by prejudicing the prince against Isabella if he persisted in that union, or by diverting his attention to a wrong scent, and employing his thoughts on a visionary intrigue, prevent his engaged gauging in any new pursuit. With this unhappy policy, he answered in a manner to confirm Manfred on the belief of some connection between Isabella and the youth. The prince, whose passions wanted little fuel to throw them into a blaze, fell into a rage at the idea of what the friar suggested. I will fathom to the bottom of this intrigue, cried he, and quitting Jerome sharp abruptly, with a command to remain there till his return, he hastened to the great hall of the castle and ordered the peasant to be brought before him. Thou hardened young impostor, said the prince as soon as he saw the youth. What becomes of thy boasted veracity now? It was providence, was it, and the light of the moon that discovered the lock of the trapdoor to thee. Tell me, audacious boy, who thou art, and how long thou hast been acquainted with the princess, and take care to answer with less equivocation than thou didst last night, or torches shall wring the truth from thee. The young man, perceiving that his share in the flight of the princess was discovered, <laughs> and concluding that anything he should say could no longer be of service or detriment to her, replied, I am no impostor, my lord, nor have I deserved opprobrious language. I answered to every question your highness put to me last night with the same veracity that I shall speak now, and that will not be from fear of your torches, but because my soul abhors a falsehood. Please to repeat your questions, my lord. I am ready to give you all the satisfaction in my power. I love this extra young man. He's very extra. I like to think he's got, like, long hair that he flicks in, in like, disgust or in, like, extra temper when he talks. We are in the period of manly curls. So I love a good manly curl. You know my questions, replied the prince, and only want time to prepare an evasion. Speak directly. Who art thou, and how long hast thou been known to the princess? I am a labourer of the next village, said the present. My name is Theodore. The princess found me in the vault last night. Before that hour, I never was in her presence. I may believe as much or as little as I please of this, said Manfred, but I will hear thy own story by before I examine into the truth of it. Tell me, what reason did the princess give thee for making her escape? Thy life depends on thy answer. She told me, replied Theodore, that she was on the brink of destruction, and that if she could not escape from the castle... <coughs> She was in danger in a few moments of being made miserable for ever. And on this slight foundation, on a silly girl's report, said Manfred, thou didst hazard my displeasure? I fear no man's displeasure, <laughs> said Theodore, when a woman in distress puts herself under my protection. During this examination, Matilda was going to the apartment of Hippolyta. At the upper end of the hall, where Manfred sat, was a boarded gallery, with lattice windows, through which Matilda and Bianca were to pass. Hearing her father's voice and seeing the servants assembled round him, she stopped to learn the occasion. The prisoner soon drew her attention. The steady and composed manner in which he answered, and the gallantry of his last reply, which were the first words she heard distinctly interested her in his favour. His person was noble, handsome and commanding, even in that situation, but his countenance soon engrossed her whole care. Heavens! Said, Heavens, Bianca, said the princess softly. Do I dream? Is that, or is not that youth the exact resemblance of Alfonso's picture in the gallery? She could say no more, for her father's voice grew louder at every word. This bravado, said he, surpasses all thy former insolence. Thou shalt experience the wrath with which thou dost darest trifle. Seize him, continued Manfred, and bind him. The first news the princess hears of her champion shall be that he has lost her his head for her sake. The injustice of which thou art guilty towards me, said Theodore, convinces me that I have done a good deed in delivering the princess <laughs> from thy tyranny. Maybe she ha be may she be happy, whatever becomes of me. I just I love him so much. This is a lover, 
cried Manfred in a rage. A peasant within sight of death is not animated by such sentiments. Tell me, tell me, rash boy, who thou art, or the rack shall force thy secret from thee. Thou hast threatened me with death already, said the youth. For the truth I have told thee, if that is all the encouragement I am to expect for sincerity, I am not tempted to indulge thy vain curiosity further. Then thou wilt not speak, said Manfred. I will not, replied he. Bear him away into the courtyard, said Manfred. I will see his head this instant severed from his body. Matilda fainted at hearing these words. Bianca shrieked and cried, Help! Help! The princess is dead! <laughs> Manfred startled at this ejaculation and demanded what was the matter. The young peasant, who heard it too, was struck with horror and asked eagerly the same question, but Manfred ordered him to be hurried into the court and kept there for execution till he informed himself of the cause of Bianca's shrieks. When he learned the meaning, he treated it as a womanish panic, and ordering Matilda to be carried to her apartment, he rushed into the court, and calling for one of his guards, bade Theodore kneel down and prepare to receive the fatal blow. The undaunted youth received the bitter sentence with a resignation that touched every heart but Manfred's. He wished earnestly to know the meaning of the words he had heard relating the to the princess, but fearing to exasperate the tyrant more against her, he desisted. The only boon he deigned to ask was that he might be permitted to have a confessor and make his peace with heaven. Manfred, who hoped by the confessor's means to come at the youth's history, readily granted his response, his request, and being convinced that Father Jerome was now in his interest, he ordered him to be called and shrive the prisoner. Manfred's really not very bright. He's not very bright. I also like how he's so, he too is drawn by the drama. I know. He's like, I have to know. I have to know what's going on. I need to know who this young man is. The holy man, who had little foreseen the catastrophe that his imprudence occasioned, fell on his knees to the prince and adjured him in the most solemn manner not to shed innocent blood. He accused himself of the bitterest terms for his indiscretion, endeavoured to disculpate the youth, and left no method untried to, so to soften the tyrant's rage. Didn't you tell us a chapter ago that Manfred wasn't a tyrant? No, he's a tyrant. He's just a good tyrant. No, he said earlier that he wasn't a tyrant. No, he's a good tyrant. He's a good tyrant. But he said in words, those syllables, Manfred was not a tyrant. You know what I'm going to say, And now he don't said you? that he's a tyrant. Don't you dare say this is a gothic novel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. Manfred, more incensed than appeased by Jerome's intercession, whose retraction now made him suspect he had been imposed upon by both, commanded the friar to do his duty, telling him he would not allow the prisoner many minutes for confession. Nor do I ask many, my lord, said the unhappy young man. My sins, thank heaven, have not been numerous, nor exceed what might be expected by my years. Dry your tears, good father, and let us dispatch. This is a bad world, nor have I had cause to leave it with regret." Just the amount of dragging Manfred that's going on in the courtyard right now is is beautiful. Oh, wretched youth, said Jerome. How canst thou bear the sight of me with patience? I am thy murderer. <coughs> Are you right? It is I who have brought this dismal hour upon thee. I forgive, I forgive thee from my soul, said the youth, as I hope heaven will pardon me. Hear my confession, father, and give me thy blessing. How can, how can I prepare thee for thy passage as I ought, said Jerome? Thou canst not be saved without pardoning thy foes, and canst thou forgive that impious man there? I can, said Theodore, and I do. <laughs> I mean, that has to be infuriating if you're Manfred as well. Right, like, he's doing this on purpose. How dare you forgive me? I curse thou, and does th not this touch thee, cruel prince, said the friar. I sent for thee to confess him, said Manfred sternly, not to plead for him. Thou did first incense me against him, his blood be upon thy head. It will, it will, said the good man in no, it's, agony it's, it's and sorrow. pretty much your head because you're the one killing him. There would I must never hope to go where this blessed youth is going. Dispatch, said Manfred. I am no more to be moved by the whining of priests than by the shrieks of women. What, said the youth, is it possible that my fate could have occasioned what I heard? Is the princess then again in thy power? Thou dost remember me of my wrath, said Manfred. Prepare thee, for this moment is thy last. The youth, who felt his indignation rise, and who was touched with the sorrow with which he saw he had infused into all the spectators, as well as into the friar, suppressed his emotions, and putting off his doublet and unbuttoning his collar, knelt down to his prayers. As he stooped, his shirt flipped open above his shoulder, and discovered the mark of a bloody arrow. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Twist! 
gracious heaven, cried the holy man, starting. What do I see? It is my child, my Theodore. Seriously, everybody is always discovering their children by birthmarks. Yep. The passions that ensued must be conceived. They cannot be painted. The tears of the assistants were suspended by wonder rather than stopped by joy. They seemed to inquire in the eyes of their lord what they ought to feel. Surprise, doubt, tenderness, respect succeeded each other in the countenance of the youth. He received with modest submission the effusion of the old man's tears and embraces, yet afraid of giving a loose to hope and suspecting from what had passed the inflexibility of Manfred's temper, he cast a glance towards the prince as if to say, Canst thou be unmoved at such a scene as this? Manfred's yeah, heart yes. was capable of being touched. He forgot his anger in his astonishment, yet his pride forbade his owning himself affected. He even doubted whether this discovery was not a contrivance of the friar to save the youth. What may this mean? said he. How can he be thy son? Is it consistent with thy profession or reputed <laughs> sanctity to allow a peasant offspring for the fruit of thy irregular amours? Please don't laugh at such a fantastic sentence as thy irregular I'm amours. so sorry. Would you like to read it again? <clears throat> no, I'm done now. Oh, God, said the holy man. Dost thou question his being mine? Could I feel the anguish I do if I were not his father? Spare him, good prince, spare him, and revile me as thou pleasest. Peace! said Manfred sternly. I must know more ere I am disposed to pardon. A saint's bastard may be no saint himself. Wow. Injurious lord, said Theodore, and not insult to cruelty. If I am this venerable man's son, though no prince as thou art, know the blood that fo flows in my veins. Yes, said the father, interrupting him. His blood is noble, nor is he that abject thing, my lord, you speak him. He is my lawful son, and Sicily can boast of few houses more ancient than that of Falconara. But alas, my lord, what is blood? What is nobility? We are all reptiles, miserable, sinful creatures. It is piety alone that could distinguish us from the dust whence we sprung, and whither we must return. Truce to your sermon, said Manfred. You forget you are no longer Friar Jerome, but the Count of Falconara. Let me know your history. You will have time to moralise hereafter. I mean, he can be both. <coughs> you know, know that, right? right? Like, how has he stopped being a friar just because you know he used to be a count? Like, that's, that's not how holy orders work, so... If you should not happen to obtain the grace of that sturdy criminal there. Sturdy criminal. Mother of God, said the friar. Is it possible my lord can refuse a father the life of his only, his long-lost child? Trample me, my lord, scorn, afflict me, accept my life for his, but spare my son. It's Manfred. What do you think the answer is? I mean, I think you should just start telling him the story, sir. I mean, unless there's a good reason why you aren't. No, I think he's having hysterics. Oh, everyone's always having hysterics. It is a gothic novel. Hysterics are part of the theme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I like that I got away with saying that Thou canst feel then Said Manfred What it is to lose an only son A little hour ago thou didst preach up resignation to me My house If fate so please must perish That the Count of Falconara Okay that's a little different He's saying try to bear your loss with Try to bear your loss with some sort, with some dignity and grace and don't go raping teenage girls. Yeah, it's not the same as now kill everyone else's sons so they feel the same way. It's, there's a difference between please don't murder my child in front of me <coughs> and please don't do, well, the thing I already said. There's a scale there. Alas, my lord, said Jerome, I confess I have offended, but aggravate not an old man's sufferings. I boast not of my family, nor think of such vanities. It is nature that pleads for this boy. It is the memory of the dear woman that bore him. Is she, Theodore, is she dead? Her soul has long been with the blessed, said Theodore. Oh, how, said Jerome, tell me. No, she is happy. Thou art all my care now. Most dread lord, will you... Will you grant me my poor boy's life? Return to thy convent, answered Manfred. Conduct the princess hither. Obey me in what else thou knowest, and I promise thee the life of thy son. He's such a dick. Oh, my lord, said Jerome. Is honesty the price I must pay for this dear youth's safety? For me, cried Theodore, let me die a thousand deaths rather than stain thy conscience. Bless him. What is it the tyrant would exact of thee? Is the princess safe from his power? Protect her, thou venerable old man, and let all his wrath fall on me. 
Jerome endeavoured to check the impetu impetuosity of the youth, and ere Manfred could reply, the trampling of horses was heard, and a brazen trumpet which hung without the gate of the castle was suddenly sounded. At the same instant, the sable plumes on the enchanted helmet, which still remained at the other end of the court, were tempestuously agitated and nodded thrice, as if bowed by some invisible wearer. I like that he felt the need to remind us the helmet was still there. Well, it could have disappeared. I suppose. So. That is the end of chapter two. Mm-hmm. Which was less dramatic than chapter one in a lot of ways. It was you mostly think? the fallout. I mean, the twist with the sun was dramatic, but there was much less running through underground passages and looking for trapdoors. I mean, that is also and true. And ghosts. There were less ghosts. I feel like there was slightly more consistency within this chapter than there was in the first chapter as well. That's true. It was a more consistent plot. Like, uh, there was slightly less bouncing around the timeline. There was still a little bit of it, but less of it. And we got to see a bit more of Miranda and her servant, which was nice. Matilda. Matilda. Yeah, I knew I'd gotten the name wrong. Mm -hmm. I kind of... I feel like there was so much... I keep saying there was so much promise, but... Matilda could have been a much more interesting character just by having her be consistent and psychologically realistic. Yeah. It's it's more of the bouncing back and forth between, but this is what women are supposed to be, so it must be how they work. It's like that bit in, Victor, in Les Miserables where Victor Hugo goes on about how the peculiar submission that only women are capable of to the whims of the men in their lives, and it's like, well... It's not that men couldn't do that. It's that the women don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. They're not doing it because it's some sort of feminine grace. It's because they literally have no other option. I am a big fan of Theodore. He lightens my life. I and love Jerome's him. like sass towards Manfred was also great. I am sad that now Jerome can't sass Manfred anymore. That yeah. is tragic and a loss that will be felt around the world. Also, I like. I felt like the scene with Matilda and Bianca was fun, but could have been shorter. Mm -hmm. Like there was a lot of Bianca, and I <laughs> love Bianca, but I feel like it could have been tightened a bit to be more. Perhaps fun. there could have been less Bianca. Um, maybe a little less in the scene. I'm always happy for there to be Bianca because I don't think she's as dim as Matilda thinks she is. She just likes gossip, and you know what else is there for her to do? Gossip mm. and take care of a princess. Like the interest in her life surely comes from the gossip. I mean... Also, there are ghosts happening. Like, let the poor woman have comfort in something. I do like how Matilda was like, can't, you can't possibly have heard something, but she had. Yeah, and then Matilda heard it. Um, yeah. uh, not a bad chapter. Uh, definitely less jumping around from topic to topic. Less uh, wild swings and um, strange things happening. I feel like he remembered what he was doing consistently throughout this chapter. Yeah, I feel like he was on point. I mean, only within the chapter, but... I do think some things were dropped and then forgotten, like the mm -hmm. uh, renowned... Is it astrologer? Yes, I just... Th I want more information about this. I mean, I know it's, it's meant to... You could to... just, like... That could have been introduced in the previous chapter when it was like Manfred was sending him up to that room. You could have said the room that had been empty since... The person in it had committed suicide. And then Bianca could have expanded on that. But we just had no... It took a long time for me to piece together that that was the peasant. Because I was like, surely it would have been mentioned in the previous chapter if that room was such a, a big deal. Or did you think we were actually going to get the astrologer's ghost? No, no. I just thought that, you know, Manfred, when he was said he was going to send him to, like, that room... If it was such a big deal and no one had slept in it since the guy died, I felt like there would have been some mention of that in that chapter, which is why I didn't think like it was the peasant. I thought it was someone else. Yeah, I mean, I know it's in there to imply that he killed himself because he worked out what was going to happen to the family through his astrological knowledge, and it was so horrifying he killed himself. But I really feel like you can't just drop something like that in there. There has to be some... You have to do something more with it. Yeah. Yeah, like, I think if that was what the author was doing, I mean, I didn't even pick up on that. I just thought, there's a lot of bad luck in this castle. Um, I think if that was what we're meant to be taking from it, it definitely needed more foreshadowing and more I mean, work on it. I think that must be it. 
I think you're right now you've mentioned it. I just thought it was more of the of the weird omen slash bad luck that was um. stalking this family, not even their tutors stay alive. They just <laughs> kill themselves <laughs> randomly. He read the stars and noped right on out. <laughs> I know. He was like, nope, not going to stick around for that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a more solid chapter. Also very solid in prose. There are no paragraphs. There are no quotation marks. He does not break it at any point. I do not know who is speaking from one <laughs> sentence to another and have to skim ahead so I can tell if it's changed person or if someone has come into the room. I also love how Manfred apparently failed to notice that he looks like the picture of the, of the former prince. That confuses me. Surely the man with his obsession of like the curse and his like paranoia about the heir returning would have noticed the resemblance if he's that striking like Lee Simba. I mean, I'm assuming it's his sheer self obsession that got in the way. No one assumes. But also, again, he got so irritated by Father Jerome and <coughs> and Theodore that he forgot to finish getting the rest of the story out of them. He did, didn't he? Yeah. Which for once I think is not inconsistent writing. I think it's actually just that Manfred is like that. Manfred. Not entirely on top of things. Manfred, kind of self-obsessed. Oh, really? A little bit. Manfred, a bit of a dick. <laughs> still quite compelling as a character. Still interesting to read. You, you know when Manfred is in the scene, something's going to happen. With um, Matilda and Bianca, they might just speak for like three pages straight about whether or not princes are interesting. When Manfred is in the room, he's going to fuck shit up. It's not going to be pleasant for the people involved, but he's going to do something like go, I know, I'm going to execute you. Take him out to the courtyard now. Just do it. Because I think he might have had sex with the princess. Or at least he wants to, and I can't be having that. <coughs> I am the only one who's allowed to want to have sex with the princess. Oh, so I read this uh, thing, and I actually really disagree with it as a criticism, mm -hmm. where um, the bit about... Bianca talking about how it's better to have a bad husband than no husband mm. is, according to at least one critic, supposed, supposedly about Bianca reaffirming being the author's voice, which, given the thing about servants, doesn't seem very likely. Yeah. But is apparently being the author's voice to confirm that women are objects to be used by men and that this is right and proper and therefore even though marriage is bad for women it's worse for a woman not to be married because a woman is supposed to be used by the men around her whereas what it almost certainly actually is is a recognition of that while men are likely to mistreat their their wives being an unmarried woman is worse because it gives you a significantly lower social status and you have less power and freedom I thought it was clear that he was just doing a poor man's Juliet and her nurse. Mm. Like, that is so clearly the dynamic that they have between each other. Like, it's... Well, yeah, that too. But, I mean, the whole point is it's worse to be unmarried because you're treated like a shameful burden. Or, you know, you go into a convent and while Matilda clearly would enjoy that, someone who doesn't have that kind of vocation just thinks it sounds boring and depressing. Exactly, and Bianca's coming at it from a working woman's point of view as well, in which, you know, if she was married, she'd have more stability, more status, more money. If she was like Donna, or what was her name? Donna Rosara. Yeah, Donna Rosara is a potential replacement for her because she's married and therefore a more senior type of woman. Yeah, and um, I, I assume the implication there is, is that an unmarried maidservant is all well and good when you are yourself an unmarried young lady, but once you become a great princess and You're marry, supposed to have a matron. Yeah, you're meant to have, like, a proper senior lady. I mean, he's definitely going with women are supposed to... Women are supposed to revolve around their nearest male relative. They're supposed to exist entirely to be his emotional support, to see to his whims, to fulfil his desires in every conceivable way and never, ever, ever be unhappy or have feelings of their own. But I really don't think Bianca's whole thing about how it's better to have a bad husband than no husband is meant to reinforce that, given how... It I was... just took it as a very cynical read from a woman of the times. And know? also, I mean, it was common wisdom at the time. Exactly. Without a husband, 
you're what's nothing. gonna happen to you without a husband there's no one to protect you from the other man out there yeah or starving to death exactly so it made sense to me as something a woman might actually say especially one in that position yeah and honestly being being a great princess even if your husband's a shit is a lot more fun than being the unwanted unmarried sister of a prince mm. yeah so good chapter I'm invested. I want to know what happens to Theodore. Yeah. I really... I, I There is a lot I dislike about this novel. I know it probably seems weird that I'm so enthusiastic about Father Jerome and Theodore. But given how much I hate this book. But I really do love them. I They're a bright spot in a terrible, terrible novel. Alright, yeah. See you next time. Bye. Abba. I'm gonna. I think I will probably cut some stuff out. I might take out our digression about giants because I think that went on for a while. Yeah, you can if you want. I might. We'll we'll listen to it though. Also, I bet I can edit out the bit where you burped. Mm. I bet I can do that. <laughs>